Hello again, I am Blunty. This is the Oculus Go. It is a $200 completely self-contained VR headset. No need to snap in a smartphone, no need to connect it to a PC, no cables, no extra sensors to scatter around the room. Just strap it to your face and do things in VR. It is thusly the easiest, cleanest and most affordable way to get into virtual reality. It comes with a wireless controller, a USB charger, and a microfiber cloth to keep the lens clean, and that's everything you need. Well, almost everything you need. For some stupid reason, Oculus were too rushed or too stupid to build in a way to set the device up to log in or to create a new user account and connect it to your Wi-Fi so you can download new apps and such. So you still need to connect it wirelessly to a smartphone, either Apple or Android will do, but only for the initial setup. Up. But after that, you're free and clear of any kind of support gear. Although you can later on choose to browse and purchase and tag for download games and apps from the store using the phone app, and it will automatically sync everything across to the headset, which is nice. Externally, it is a clean and elegant design, which I quite like. You basic rounded face rectangle for the screen, lenses and all the electronics that do things, and a nice but basic elasticized set of straps, adjustable for various head sizes via Velcro, to keep it on your head. And all of this in a nice, subtle, inoffensive grey. There's a headphone jack and a micro USB charging port on the side. You can also use this USB port to connect to a computer to load videos and such onto the onboard memory. You can also use it to take off screenshots and videos you've taken. Up top, a volume rocker and a power switch flank a small LED for power, state and charging indications. And inside the faceplate, between the two lenses, you'll see a small proximity sensor, which is used to detect when it's on your face for automatic power up when you put it on, and it'll power off the same way a short time after you take it off. It's a simple, intelligent, and user-friendly way to maximize battery life and ease of use. The Oculus Go comes in two variants, the only difference being the onboard storage space for apps and media. The standard one is 32 gigabytes, and for 50 bucks extra, you can double it to 64 gigabytes. Now, 32 should be enough for the average user, but if you plan to store a lot of content locally, especially downloaded VR videos, it may very well be worth your money for the 64 gigabyte version, as there's no option for expandable storage via an SD card. What is built in is all you get. The most vital aspect, of course, the screen and the lenses are both in the pretty good category. A few years on from the original designs of its PC-based forebear, the Oculus Rift, we get a boost to both resolution and clarity over even what the Rift and the HTC Vive offer you with their full PC-based experiences. The Oculus Go has a single 5.5-inch display with a 2560x1440 resolution, netting you 1280x1440 per eye. Now, the recordings you're seeing here, by the way, are 1024x1024, which is what the built-in video recording function produces. And without any kind of mirroring or video output, this is the only way I can show you gameplay. And they record at pretty low bit rates too, which is why they look overcompressed. But inside the headset, with a pair of actual human eyes, the experience is pretty good. Field of view feels just slightly narrower than something like the Rift, but it is entirely acceptable. There's a relatively minor amount of concentric rings caused by the Fresnel lenses. Screen door effects, where you can see the spaces between pixels, is pretty minor. You'll see it if you really look for it in very bright areas especially, but it's basically a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. The central focus sweet spot is decently sized, and the amount of artifacting at the edges with things like chromatic aberration and distortions is acceptable. There is some, but it's not distracting and only really obvious when you look for it. And while almost every VR headset I've ever used gives you a rounded roll-off to your vision edges, here, at the very top, the very bottom, and both sides, they've got a kind of a squared-off edge to them. It's not severe, and the light fall-off that naturally occurs with this kind of lens hides it somewhat, but if you're used to higher-end VR HMDs, you will notice it fairly regularly. Aside from that, I'm pretty satisfied. The image is clear, bright, and comparatively crisp, and indeed, it's a visual experience that is superior to the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, but not quite on par with the Windows MR headsets like the Dell one I use. But when it comes to the refresh rate, there's some issues. By default, the Go runs at 60 hertz, while PC-based VR targets 90 hertz for maximum comfort. Now, personally, I'm not super sensitive to this change. I can certainly notice it, but it doesn't cause me any real issues. But some people may find that motion sickness can set in a bit with this lower refresh rate. 
What I also noticed was in some experiences, especially with bright images, especially VR videos, which are themselves playing back at lower frame rates, there was a fairly subtle but quite noticeable flickering. This can be mediated somewhat by turning down the screen brightness, and it wasn't ever present, but when it did come up, it was quite uncomfortable. The Oculus Go does have the ability to go into a 72Hz mode as well, which will be more power hungry, but will all but eliminate these issues for basically everybody. But it is a line of code that a developer must add to their app and republish it to enable this on a per app basis. Doesn't work with everything, doesn't work by default. And with the Go so new, barely anyone has actually done that yet. So I withhold verdict on the 72Hz mode for now. But overall, I'd call the visual experience acceptable. There's also stereo speakers built in, which channel the sound along the initial rigid parts of the strap mechanism, which rather surprisingly effectively channels a pretty decent sounding experience right to your ears. Now, of course, as I pointed out in my announcement day preview video for this device, while this is a damn nice feature, not having to find and plug in headphones and deal with the dangling cord and whatnot, and still getting a full stereo directional sound experience. So for the sake of some relative comparison, this is my regular tone of, this is my regular volume for, for conversational sort of speaking and stuff, so you can get an idea about how well the microphone is picking me up in this. So I'm about to press play on uh, the Bojack Horseman opening theme, so you can sort of get a good idea about how much sound leaks out of this. Let me just make sure I am, where's my volume button there? Let's max out the volume, so we're at maximum volume here. So it should be really quite loud for me, but how much are you gonna hear? Let's find out. That's actually too loud. I'm gonna come down to a comfortable listening volume there. So as you can hear, Sound definitely leaks sound, but the sound I'm getting sort of inside the headset here is, I mean, it's not headphone quality, but it is certainly rich enough for watching videos and sort of other experiences and games and things like that. It is satisfactory. So, you know, headphones for those more intimate VR videos, right? That aside, the quality of the sound from the built-in speakers is rather a step above what I had anticipated, and it is an entirely acceptable and practical way to deal with the audio side of VR experiences. And being piped along the structure of the device itself instead of being a somewhat clumsy if pleasantly sounding ear cups attached to the head strap, it solves this issue in a way that still keeps the Oculus Go very compact, very light, and highly portable, which for this device was clearly a key design note. Which is also why we have cloth straps, of course, instead of a more comfortable and much bulkier option, like my personal preference, the halo ring. Which, of course, does lead us to the discussion of comfort. One of the reasons I like the halo ring, as seen in the PlayStation VR headset and most Windows MR headsets, is that it balances the weight of the screen box across your whole head and doesn't actually put any pressure at all on your face. While the straps of devices like this are designed to pull the whole unit into your face and press it against your face and use that physical contact and force to hold it there and all the weight is at the front. It works, it's just not the most comfortable option possible. There's no adjustment for interpupillary distance and my own is fairly wide at 70 millimeters, while the average is around 64, but I had no real issue with that. Glasses wearers will be happy to know that there is a spacer included in the box to give you a bit more room too. Now, my eyes do feel slightly more fatigued after a long session in this than they do from my often many hours long sessions in my Windows MR headset, but only to the point where I notice it, not quite to the point of it causing issues like dizziness or even headaches. That said, I have spent a lot of time in various VR headsets, and I'm much less sensitive to typical VR overuse fatigue symptoms than I once was. Your mileage may vary, and if you have comfort issues after use, I'd suggest slowly ramping up the time you spend in VR, just five or 10 minutes at a time at first, and slowly extend on that. That's what I did, and these days I can and do spend hours upon hours in VR quite happily. But back to the Go specifically. Overall, physical comfort and general fit is better than many VR units of this type. Its weight and interface materials are comfortable enough. It doesn't tend to drag itself out of ideal position from its own weight or by movements. Sweat wasn't an issue. Lens fogging was not an issue. Heat wasn't an issue. Although the front panel of this device does get quite warm during active use because that's where the heat spreader is for all the components. It got pretty warm but never sort of disturbingly hot to touch. 
And I have worn this thing for two hours straight, which is almost all it can do on a single battery charge anyway. And I've done so without any major issues. Well, any major issues beyond the issue you always, if you'll allow me the pun, the issue you always face with this type of fitting. Okay, so the, the battery on my main camera just died, which means I'm, I'm sort of done sort of recording uh, some VR stuff by now. So I'm going to unplug my headphones here. Now, the reason I grabbed my phone to show you this is I wanted to show you this. The, when I spoke about the comfort level, I told you it was pressing into my phone. So I've been wearing this for, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes while I was recording a bunch of demo stuff, I guess. I really didn't, I don't know how much time yet. I'm a 38% battery, so it's probably about an hour's worth-ish. Uh, maybe a little bit more. Anyway. I'm going to take off the visor and we're going to see if I have the uh, classic VR rings, which never, ever, ever happen with my uh, Dell Windows Mixed Reality headset because of the halo system it uses. It. The, 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 this bit doesn't press into my face at all on that. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I, it looks like I got a tan actually, just the way it's pressing into my face, squishing the blood away from that part of the skin a little bit. And the rest of my face is flush because it did get quite warm in here while I was filming. So, yeah, just as a, an example of the, uh, yeah, the comfort level of this, it's fine, but you are going to wind up with VR face for a little bit and VR head as well. So the middle of my hair there pressed down where the top strap was. I don't love it. Hopefully they come out with some sort of replacement strap or something for this. I would much rather a halo system. Bulkier. You know, more expensive to manufacture, sure, which is why they went with the straps in the first place, but much more comfortable. Moving on now to the controller. It feels decent in hand, resting in the palm nicely, and all four interface controls falling under thumb and finger nicely. It is ambidextrous in design, and you can set the interface to default to right or left handedness to suit you. It is powered by single AA batteries and connects automatically over what I assume is low energy Bluetooth. Battery life is unknown at this point. Frankly, I've used this thing for hours and hours now and haven't ticked off one little section of its own battery monitor. But I can tell you that the Samsung Gear VR controller is rated for up to 80 hours of use on its battery and I see no reason why this shouldn't be around about the same. It is basically the same technology. But it is nicer than both Samsung's very similarly appointed Gear VR controller and Google's own more limited and TV remote flat-like controller. There's a nice chunky trigger button with a quite pleasant tactile feel and a nice solid click while staying nice and quiet whilst doing the clicking. The basic buttons of the Oculus and back buttons are small and close, but I had no problems finding them blind or accidental presses. And the circular touchpad, which is both capacitive touch sensitive and has a push in click, worked well enough, but the click does feel kind of hollow and unsatisfying. While the touch sensitivity worked all right, the software UI does need some tweaking to make it feel a bit better when swiping and scrolling and such. Its three degrees of freedom accelerometer movement and tracking was pretty reliable, but drift does set in pretty regularly, requiring a quick recalibration by holding down the Oculus button for a few seconds. Same is true of the motion sensors in the headset itself, actually. Drift sets in slowly, but near inevitably, and not all software was responsive to that built-in on-the-fly recalibration. All in all, though, the hardware is better than I'd expected at this price point. Now, for the second half of the essential recipe, the software. You've already been watching me go through various experiences, and as someone who has a PC-based VR room scale set up at home, I can tell you this. It's very much a lightweight mobile VR experience, which is hardly a shock now, is it? The hardware inside the Oculus Go is literally the same kind of hardware you'll find in modern VR-capable smartphones. In fact, the CPU is a generation behind what's currently in use, but... It's not doing everything we need a phone to be doing for it to work properly. For example, it's not running a bunch of background telecommunications stuff. And so the hardware and software in the Go can be targeted and optimized for a pure VR experience. And it is certainly superior to every VR experience I've had with a phone snapped into a headset. Not just from an audio-visual perspective, but from a usability point of view as well. Mobile phone-based VR always feels compromised, clumsy, awkward, janky even. But everything here feels pretty native to VR. There's still some polishing to be done with the UI, especially its tendency to put some things like text and some other interface prompts at the lower edges of the screen. Where on a flat screen they might make sense, but here the lenses make it blurry and difficult to read that low. But for the most part, the basic underlying operating system and interface does feel VR native. 
The software library is already pretty vast, as it is 100% binary compatible with any and every app that works on the Samsung Gear VR platform. Oculus boasts that this gives them over 1,000 apps at launch, and while that's probably true, we do face the same problem here as we do on Android and Apple phone app marketplaces. There's a lot of crappy shovelware. There's half-baked clones of more popular apps, half-assed and sleazy so-called free-to-play games filled to the gills with every kind of hateful, anti-consumer, anti-humanity, egregious, disgusting, vile, sleazy, microtransaction bullcrappery. But Compared to the general Android marketplace, which at this point is so poisoned with crap and frankly malware, it's basically useless. Here, as the space is still small, it is certainly easier to find the good apps. The games, for the most part, are very, very simple and almost always very, very short. Even the licensed stuff like The Suicide Squad or Ghost in the Shell and Tomb Raider, they're all the thinnest of experiences possible. And of course, many games are designed for the lowest common denominator, meaning a crap phone snapped into a crap plastic VR shell. And as such, they have no real meaningful support for the motion controller and do things like staple a gun to your face instead of your hand, which feels super stupid, especially once you've experienced proper motion-controlled aiming in VR. And still others are pooping out cheap, clumsy knockoffs of popular games from real developers that rely on the most basic of wild flailing from the controller, and it just doesn't work in any way remotely satisfying. And then, as with the broader mobile gaming scene, there's a few gems of actually carefully and lovingly and skillfully crafted games, like Kev's Compulsion. It's a plain and very basic looking puzzle game, and while it doesn't really need or benefit from VR in any meaningful way actually, it's still a very nice little puzzle game. And then there's Star Wars Droid Repair Bay, a slightly dumbed down version of a VR title I've actually played and enjoyed with a full PC based and fully room scale VR setup. So in short, when it comes to games, that's just not the reason to buy an Oculus Go. Gaming is, at best, simple, short, thin and uncomplicated, I think is the kindest word we can use, and at worst, it's every single thing that's terrible, toxic, abusive, and horrible about what mobile gaming in general has devolved into. The better use for the Oculus Go is more passive experiences. And on that front, you've got everything from 360 and 180 degree photos and videos, all the way through to digital experiences you can move around in, streaming VR video services, and all the way down to watching traditional video content like Netflix and YouTube, but in your own private, distraction-free VR environment. Whatever you choose that to be. Living room? Cinema? The moon? The web browser, which is also currently the only way to watch YouTube, having no native app yet, works well enough. It's a bit sluggish, but it's simple, and it's easy, and it gets the job done. It'll even correctly support streaming VR videos from websites like YouTube. Apps like Big Screen even let you share viewing experiences with friends, like sitting in a virtual theatre with them while watching TV or movies or games or whatever you like up on the virtual big screen. And that experience can fold out into more general social VR experiences, like Altspace VR, which is very similar in execution to the extremely popular PC-based social VR app, VRChat. Except without room scale, or at the very least properly free space motion tracked controllers, it's a lot more basic and frankly, more than a bit awkward to actually use. I can see it getting better as the devs work harder to make movement and object interactivity work better, but for now, it's a very pale shadow of what VRChat offers for PC-based big boy VR headsets. So, like games, we hit a limit there, inherent in both what the devs can and have done, and the hardware itself. But keep your expectations controlled, and there is a decent and worthwhile social VR experience to be had here. Big Screen in particular, I think, will nail it quite well. They've already spent years working on the PC-based experience, and their Oculus Go app is already a remarkably similar experience. A more solitary experience in a painting app once more shines a harsh light on just how limiting and teasing a 3 degrees of freedom controller is compared to the 6 degrees of freedom of free space controllers for PC-based VR. It is an okay experience, you might be able to get something worthwhile done, but having to move your brush in three dimensions by using the touchpad to move yourself along the X and Y while you control or paints along the perpendicular axes, it's just so much less intuitive and fun than doing so in free space with room scale VR, where it just 
feels natural. But finally, we have what I think is the very best and most enjoyable application and use for the Oculus Go, the passive VR entertainment option. Having your own distraction-free space to watch things like Netflix is really, really nice, and especially for those that share their living spaces with other people or just don't have room for a nice and big TV, it's actually a very pleasant experience and pretty convincing of a large projector screen. And the full-on 180 and 360 degree videos are pretty cool too. Right now, most of the content is short and just kind of, hey, look at how cool this is, kind of stuff. But there's ever more meaningful, deliberate, and crafted VR videos being produced right now as filmmakers learn the new tools, our editing software catches up, and VR camera technology itself improves. And there's some stuff that's really very compelling to experience in VR too. I'm not much of a ball sports guy, but even I can really appreciate the vast difference in watching a football game, for example, on TV, compared to being literally surrounded by the action and in three dimensions, so you get a true sense of scale and distance and speed and power and athleticism and the crowds, and it's really quite good. And once more, if you'll allow me the obvious pun, this is a whole new ball game for enjoying sports spectating. And once they mix what this is with a social VR experience too, it'll be, wait for it, a game changer. Haha. <laughs> and if you're not into sports, there's a lot of other things that VR makes even more compelling too, like dance performances. In this example here, for the sake of some titillation, some pole dancing. Now, watching dancers and performers move in three dimensions in the space that you're virtually occupying really does add something significant and worthwhile to the experience. And the same is true of many kinds of performances, everything from big musical concerts all the way down to stuff like this one. I'd never even thought about it before, but a close-up magic act. It's super fun to see this play out in virtual space. And then, of course, there's things like travel videos and photos being surrounded by the sights and sounds and action of exotic places and people. And Oculus themselves are even pushing content creation, promising a future of VR live-streamed events, concert, comedy gigs, sporting events, and the like. And the Oculus Go is a perfect fit for all of that. Being small, light, self-contained, and ready to go in an instant makes it perfect for all this stuff. Anywhere, any room in your house, even travel with it, go into the backyard with it. It makes it so much more practical and more likely to be used for this stuff than any PC-based VR rig. And of course, far superior to the comparatively compromised experience of putting your phone in a VR holster. The Oculus Go is a fantastic sweet spot, a markedly better experience than a phone-based VR, and far more user-friendly, easier, simpler, and more accessible than PC-based VR. There is only one major hardware issue, and it's inherent in the way the tracking works, and we've touched on this already, but it's the drift. Having no way to position itself in absolute terms, there's a drift that sets in, small errors in rotational tracking that accumulate over time to such an extent that in just 25 minutes of gameplay in this crappy repetitive Suicide Squad game, which I just don't recommend, it's not very good, my forward direction had drifted by about 100 degrees. I was facing it in a entirely different direction from when I started. It's annoying, and if you're in a seated position on a couch or on a chair that just can't spin around, this can be a real issue. As I mentioned before, the Oculus Go does have a method to reset and recenter itself based on the direction you're currently looking by holding down the Oculus button on the controller for a few seconds. And while that does work fine most of the time, this app does not respect that at all. And it's not alone in this. It just doesn't work to reset the view. And that is a bit of a problem. It's not Oculus's problem. It's the developer's problem. And it's not a deal breaker. And it's only a real issue sporadically in these kinds of misbehaving apps. But it is still worth mentioning because it is one of the limitations of a three degrees of freedom headset. And of course, in no way at all is this a replacement or a substitute for the full-fat VR experience of the Rift, the Vive and Windows MR virtual reality setups. But for the niche it fills, I think it's well worth the $200 in my opinion. Having it ready to go in a literal instant and being free from trailing cables make it a very pleasant tool, especially for these passive and shorter VR experiences we've been talking about. And as I suggested in my preview video, a device like this, entirely self-contained, ready to go out of the box, with the name recognition of Oculus and Facebook branding, and what I'd expect to be a significant promotional budget, the Oculus Go may just be the final step in making VR truly mainstream, accessible, and inviting 
the non-tech heads are gonna want a piece of this. It's slightly better than two hour battery life, is longer than most people will spend in VR in any one session, so that's fine. But if you do want to go longer, it can work and charge from a USB while operating. Even from a USB battery bank if you're away from home or just not close enough to a PowerPoint. A full charge time from flat is about three hours, so even that's not so bad. To wrap up, it is a good device with a good experience. It's easy enough for basically anyone to work it, and it's at a good price that make it a very temptable, giftable option. I think Oculus really nailed what they wanted this thing to be. Nothing about it is great, but it doesn't have to be great. It just has to be good enough. And that's what it was designed to be. And that's what it is. The Oculus Go. It's good enough. How's that for an advertising tagline for you? <laughs> I don't think they'll go with that one. Anyway, I will be hanging on to mine. I think I like it. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty. I've hoped you've found this useful or interesting, and I hope I've answered pretty much everything you could possibly need to know about the Oculus Go before you splash the cash. So once more, thanks for watching. I'm Blunty, and I will catch you next time. <laughs>